live we have a live laparoscopic workshop on uh, 23rd uh, uh, webcasting from peradenia uh, sorry uh, from candy uh, there will be li live laparoscopic uh, fundoplication as well as a splenectomy and then in between we are going to have uh, a fruitful discussion on uh, laparoscopic right colon mobilization and uh, rectal mobilization and also discussions on uh, catastrophes that we have encountered during laparoscopic surgery. Uh, so uh, uh, so uh, I take this opportunity to invite all of you uh, to join this session. It will be live. Those who want to come to Candy, there's room in the Candy uh, uh, Teaching Hospital Auditorium. Uh, but all the others can uh, uh, join through the uh, uh, webcasting. Uh, so we have uh, sent the registration link to you. Uh, so uh, uh, please register and make this, uh, uh, I would call it a masterclass, uh, useful uh, teaching and learning experience to all of you. Uh, so Ishan is, has joined. Uh, thank you very much, Ishan. Uh, for uh, taking all the trouble to preparing this uh, session. Uh, without further delay, we have got uh, about nearly 42 participants now. Uh, we can start the webinar. Over to you, Isha. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you uh, very much, uh, Bhavanta, for those uh, kind words of uh, introduction. Uh, can you all see my screen? We can, Ishan, uh, it, it is in the, uh, if you go into the slideshow, it will be full screen. That's great. Yeah, now yeah. We can, no, no. We can, okay, yeah. fine. Thanks. Right. Thanks. So, um, good evening to all of you. And I've been asked to speak about laparoscopic anti-reflux surgery. Now, if you look at the history of this, uh, this operation was first described by Nissan in 1955. In 1956, he published a case series of just two cases. And in 1961, he uh, uh, published a full series of patients. And uh, the first laparoscopic fund application was done in 1991 by two people called G.N. Delamay in the United States. Now, the question is, is laparoscopic fundoplication the treatment of choice for gastroesophageal reflux disease? And the general consensus is that surgery is not recommended as a routine treatment for, uh, for, uh, for GORD, right? And, but it is recommended for patients with refractory gastroesophageal reflux disease and for patients whose lifestyle is significantly affected by uh, reflux disease. And these are the nice guidelines. I actually took this because if you take the, say the British Society of Gastroenterology Guidelines or the American Society of Gastroenterology Guidelines, it's kind of a little more tilted towards medical management. And then if you look at a surgical guideline, like the sages, it tends to be a little more tilted towards surgery. So uh, this, uh, the nice is kind of like middle of the road, Madhyama Pratipadava kind of thing. So moving on to uh, GORD treatment, normally what is recommended is to give a full dose proton pump inhibitor for one to two months. A full dose proton pump inhibitor means something like omeprazole 20 milligrams twice a day. If you give 20, 40 milligrams twice a day, then that would be double dose PPI. And then if patients, most patients will recover um, with the treatment for one to two months because this is a very common disease and affects 20 to 25% of the adult population. Recurrence, for recurrent symptoms, what is recommended is to give the lowest PPI dose to control symptoms and, to men and also to minimize repeat prescriptions. You can also treat this on an on-demand basis. That is initially after treating for a period and then, uh, then uh, treating on an on-demand basis. 
Now, when you look at limitations of proton pump inhibitor therapy, there are some patients who have nocturnal acid breakthrough. That is, early hours of the morning, they uh, wake up with reflux symptoms. Rather similar to patients with duodenal ulcers who have nocturnal pain, except that this pain is in the chest and it is heartburn. Also, some patients have what is called volume reflux, which may even be bile, because some patients have what is called duodenal gastric reflux. That is, you have bile and pancreatic juice refluxing into the stomach, and this tends to reflux into up the esophagus. So for these patients, you find that proton pump inhibitor therapy may not be very beneficial because it is not acid reflux. There is also some concern about the long-term safety of uh, using these drugs, though the general consensus is that proton pump inhibitors are safe for long-term use. However, in patients with uh, renal impairment, there, may, there are problems in using uh, proton pump inhibitors and in those patients, you may have to use drugs like ranitidine and nisatidine, which are H2 receptor antagonists. And also some patients are not very happy with this twice daily dosage. And also you get recurrent symptoms in um, 20 to 30% of patients who are on PPI treatment. The other thing, of course, is the cost, which we don't realize because it is a, sometimes often a very long-term cost. Whereas uh, if you do anti-reflux surgery, it's a one-time cost. So what are the indications for surgery? One indication is the need for long-term therapy, particularly in young patients. Because if you find that a patient, for instance, in his 20s, has to uh, take this for a very, very long period of time, uh, you could have problems uh, with that. The other thing is that the poor response to PPIs due to either refractoriness, intolerance, hypersensitivity, or bile reflux. The other thing is that some patients have a problem with compliance. They don't take the drugs regularly. Then, of course, if there is Barrett's esophagus, ideally, you should do a fundoplication before the occurrence of Barrett's to prevent it. But if there is early Barrett's, then that is also an indication to, uh, for uh, fundoplication. Although Barrett's itself can be treated with ablation. Then there are certain patients with respiratory complications of GORD. Some have laryngitis, others have bronchitis, some have asthma, some have pneumonia, and the others have sinusitis. And these patients tend to do well with anti-reflux surgery. When you look at the history, uh, the sorry, the preoperative assessment, uh, it's very important to take a good history from this, these patients because I have come across patients who actually don't have reflux who have undergone fundoplications, patients with irritable bowel syndrome and so on, right? So therefore, uh, you need to take a good history. There are also various symptom scores that you can use uh, to assess the severity of symptoms, but generally, these things are used uh, as research tools. It's also important to have a psychological assessment. By that, I don't mean that you need to send patients with GORD to the psychiatrist, but just to get an idea as to whether this patient is having any problems such as anxiety, depression, and so on. Because with anxiety, acid output increases, the esophagus becomes hypersensitive, and uh, many of them um, complain of these symptoms. But when you treat the anxiety, the symptoms would go away. So that is that is quite important. Uh, when it comes to investigations, all patients should undergo an upper uh, GI endoscopy, which may show a hiatus hernia in the vast majority. And some patients may have uh, esophagitis. And uh, there is a grade given to this uh, esophagitis, the Los Angeles grade or the LA grade. It's graded as A, B, and C. Uh, and so uh, it, is, it is always necessary to do an endoscopic assessment. The place for contrast swallow or barium swallow is limited 
unless you suspect that there might be a peptic stricture due to GORD. Because if there is a very subtle stricture, sometimes endoscopy can miss it. And the same thing can happen even with colonoscopy for very subtle colonic strictures, especially if you are a good endoscopist. Right? So therefore, uh, it's, uh, it's, uh, it, there, it's a limited place, but usually these patients don't have to undergo a contrast swallow. Esophageal pH is considered mandatory for these patients. And I remember a few years ago, um, the man himself, Dimister, in whose name the uh, GORD score is, uh, came to Sri Lanka and uh, there was a discussion led by Dr. Bhavanta Gamage and myself. And uh, we asked him the precise question, do you need to do pH? And he said, yes, you have to have some kind of quantification. And that is the general consensus, even in the published literature, that you should do esophageal pH prior to doing these procedures. Esophageal manometry is equally important to in exclude a motility disorder because sometimes from the patient's symptoms, you may think that this patient is having a gastroesophageal reflux disease, but he may be having a motility disorder. The other possibility is that he is having a combination of both. And in such, uh, such a situation, if you do a fundoplication, there is a risk of the patient developing post-operative dysphagia, which can sometimes be quite difficult to treat. Bile reflux monitoring, we talked about bile reflux earlier. Bile reflux monitoring is also available in centers in other countries, but we don't have it here. Now, this is what a 24-hour pH monitoring or the esophagus looks like, but uh, we must have an idea as to how to interpret this. Now, there is what is called a Demister score, and the normal is less than 14.72. Actually, in this slide, what I'm giving is the normals, right? Because you, we need to know what is normal to decide on what is abnormal. So, there is the Demister score. Then, you know, in these pH studies, there is what is called the rule of fours, right? You say that the total time the pH is less than four should be about Four to uh, less than four to four point five percent. Then we say that the up, during when the patient is upright, the pH should be less than four in uh, less than four percent of the time, and so on, right? And uh, when the patient is supine, right? When the patient is supine, the pH should be less than four, less than eight percent of the time. So if it is more than this, right? If any of these values is more than this, it is considered as an abnormal esophageal pH. However, personally, what I look at most is the correlation between the symptoms and the refluxes. The correlation between the symptoms and the refluxes. So if there is a correlation, because you know when you do these pH uh, studies, uh, there is this device which is uh, strapped on to the patient and uh, he is asked to press a certain button every time he gets reflux symptoms, right? So you know when you're the person who is reading the, the pH metry knows at what time the refluxes occur. And so if that the time the reflux uh, occurs, that is the time the acid reflux occurs, um, coincides with the patient's symptoms, then that is an indication that there is significant GORD and a situation where surgery is likely to benefit this patient. Actually, these pH studies are done to see whether this, these patients are likely to benefit from surgery. Now, when it comes to the different operations, we have the Nissan fundoplication, which is the most commonly performed procedure, right? Where you take the fundus from behind the esophagus, wrap it right round the esophagus, and then suture it anteriorly. And uh, it's basically a 360 degree wrap around. And uh, you make it short and you make it floppy. The purpose of making it short and floppy is not to make it too tight 
so that the patient will develop dysphagia. Then you have the two pay fund application, which is a partial uh, 270 degree wrap, that is also a posterior wrap. And this slide actually shows you the difference between the, the Nissan, right, which is a complete wrap, and the two pay, which is a, a partial wrap. And in fact, in the days when we used to do fund application in combination with Heller's cardiomyotomy, uh, laparoscopically for echalasia, uh, this is the fund application that I used to do because, you know, in echalasia, you divide the muscle, right? And you separate it. And what we used to do is we used to suture the, this wrap to the cut edge of the muscle, right? Uh, it kind of used to give us the feeling that this might, you know, keep the muscle open, prevent it from fusing again, though there is really no evidence for that. Then we have the door fund application, which is also referred to as the Watson fund application. Uh, in this operation, what is done is to do a 180 degree anterior wrap. And uh, when you do the door fund application, you also recreate the angle of his, I'm sorry, in this uh, picture, you are not getting the full, uh, full picture here, but you also recreate the angle of his. Because if you remember from anatomy, we talk about now, we talk about the lower esophageal sphincter and the anti-reflux mechanisms. One of them is this angle of his, which tends to widen uh, sometimes in patients with uh, with GORD, especially with hiatus hernias and so on, right? So, uh, so in the door fund application, that is corrected, but it is a 180 degree, uh, it's a 180 degree wrap. Now, what about aftercare? Usually these patients go home in one or two days. Earlier, we used to just feed them straight away, but when you look at these uh, high volume centers, a lot of places manage these patients very similar to the way they manage patients after uh, laparoscopic bariatric procedures like sleep gastrectomy uh, and uh, um, uh, uh, gastric bypass and so on. And now we also have kind of that. So we give them liquids for about two weeks. Um, and a blenderized diet for another two weeks and then give solids thereafter. But having said that, even the time when we started feeding them solids very much earlier, we actually didn't encounter a problem. And usually these patients return to work in about five to seven days. What about the side effects? Now, one thing that we worry about um, in a fund application is dysphagia. And uh, dysphagia is said to occur in about 5 to 20 percent of patients in different series. But in the vast majority, it is transient and it disappears with time. These patients also have difficulty in vomiting and also in belching because they have a wrap around their esophagus. Some of them experience postprandial fullness and bloating and uh, what is called the gas bloat syndrome. Some of them also have flatulence because if the air can't escape from above, it has to escape from somewhere, that is from below. Now, some patients after fund application develop recurrent dyspepsia. And these patients have to be carefully evaluated because the recurrent dyspepsia may not be due to recurrence of GORD. And one should not treat directly, uh, should not blindly treat with proton pump inhibitors. Uh, it is always better to do upper GI endoscopy and also all the other necessary investigations. And with an upper GI endoscopy, you can assess the extent of the rat. What about the outcomes of surgery? In good centers, there is immediate complete control of heartburn in about 90% of patients. There is also excellent relief of regurgitation and respiratory symptoms. It is also very effective 
uh, it is also, also you also get a very effective response to postural and nocturnal symptoms. There is a significant improvement in quality of life, and there is also a decreased incidence of malignant transformation. That is, in other words, uh, uh, adenocarcinoma of the esophagus. Uh, sometimes patients may develop uh, recurrent gastroesophageal reflux disease. Now, when they get refer uh, recurrent GORD, it may be due to a failure of the technique. It also can be due to what is called rep migration, where the rep migrates into the chest. And some of these patients may require supplementary proton pump inhibitors. There is also a definite place for redo fundoplication. Um, these recurrent GORD symptoms can be due to esophageal hypersensitivity or it may be due to psychological issues. Now, the results of surgery are highly surgeon dependent and good results come from high volume centers and, and also this requires a lot of expertise and also technology. And also no two patients are the same. Now, supposing you have significant a patient, for instance, with significant reflux and some motility problems on esophageal manometry, that particular patient will not be suitable for a Nissan. And you may consider doing a two-pay fund application because if you do a Nissan on that patient, you might end up with dysphagia because there is already a little problem with the motility. So that is why it's important to do these tests and assess these patients. Now, when it comes to fund application in Sri Lanka, there is a paucity of data, right? And it's something well worth auditing. Of course, we don't have you know, really high volume centers which are doing you know two, three fund applications a day. But it's well worth auditing the data because our diets are different, right? Our diets are different, and there has been some work done in India on this, but their diets are also different from ours, right? So, uh, you know, because it's always good to audit your work. Now, for example, when we looked at our laparoscopic colectomy data, we found that actually there was a better lymph node clearance in the laparoscopic approach. We didn't expect that, right? So, therefore, it's important to audit, and if we can have like a national audit, that would be still better. So, in summary, Long-term uh, PPIs can be problematic in patients who need them. And we need to consider say, uh, surgery for patients with chronic symptoms or complications. And uh, laparoscopy has definitely increased the utilization of surgery because before the advent of laparoscopy, uh, people thought twice before doing a, a fund application, before doing a, a open fund application was a major undertaking because access to that site in open surgery is difficult. Um, in fact, it is said that uh, Nissan and Albert Einstein were good friends. And uh, Einstein had GORD. But Nissan didn't want to operate on Einstein and Einstein didn't want to have a fund application either. Right? But uh, probably, you know, if he was born so, so many decades later, the situation might have been different. And of course, at that time, there would not have been PPIs or H2 receptor antagonists either, only milk. Uh, and also, there should be a lower threshold for referral to units with expertise. So, with that, uh, I come to the end of my uh, slides and I will take you through a fund application which I did exactly about a year ago. November last year, and uh, I will uh, I will share my screen and uh, we start discussing that. But in the meantime, if there are any questions, uh, please ask. Yeah, until uh, uh, thank you very much, uh, Ishan. Until Ishan gets ready with the uh, video, you can pause, uh, post any questions. We, uh, he can take it up at the end of the uh, recording uh, video or now you can just uh, uh, post your questions in the chat box and uh, he can take it later even.
So please take this opportunity to clarify your doubts. And one point, as he highlighted, it's very mandatory to assess the patient's uh, history and examination. And then, uh, personally, I would always do pH studies before embarking on this surgery. So it's very important to, you know, otherwise, even if you operate, if you don't select the patients properly, after the surgery also, the patients will have the same symptoms because you have not identified the proper problem. And uh, it will be a uh, lifelong problem to the patient as well. Over I to you. totally agree, yes. Prof. Bhavanta and Prof. Ishan, can I make a small comment? I'm Chaturanga Kapitega. Ah, yes, yes. Uh, yeah, Chaturanga. Sir, that, uh, this is uh, regarding it's uh, one of, uh, you know, experience from our side. You know, a lot of people, the, our aim is to, yeah. you know, take the, the you know, pay, pay people out of the uh, PPIs do it by doing fund obligation. Yes. But if there are concurrent yeah. problem of peptic ulcer disease and the GORD together, we need to address, we have to always tell you no know, peptic ulcer disease is a separate problem, and also the GORD is a separate problem. So if Correct. the patient having both, we might not be able to take them off PPI. I think before proceeding for the fund obligation, we have to clearly mention to the patient. Otherwise, they expect us to you know completely take the, take them out of the PPI while they are having enterogastritis, which we treat with PPIs. So yeah, I, yes, I, I would agree with that. What I generally tell them is that they may have to take, uh, they may have to take a tablet occasionally. That's what I usually tell them that they may have to take tablets. Of course, generally they may not need uh, ORD, established ORD, and uh, if they are not, because the thing is that uh, if they are having gastritis, generally we treat for that. Isn't it? We treat for that. We also treat for helicobacter. I mean, if they are having uh, if they are having uh, 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 peptic ulcer disease, but generally, what I do tell them is that yes, that they would have to take um, occasionally take a tablet. That's uh, that's of course it may not be occasional. Also, sometimes it may be a little more than occasional. But uh, generally, yes, you have to tell them that uh, at the time of uh, at the time of uh, consent. And also one, one point I would like to make uh, for all the trainees, those who are doing apergy endoscopies, please, when you uh, record your findings, please make it a habit to record. If you find uh, GORD, make sure that you uh, mention the LA grade, uh, or the, whether it is ABC, uh, because it's important for future references as well and uh, future assessments of the patient. So if you make it a habit, uh, you will continue to practice that good habit. Prof. Yeah. another thing is the size of the exactly. hydrus hernia, isn't it? So, they, they because, exactly. you know, it's yes. in, it's a size, small, medium, large, it's personal yeah. level. So, I think it's uh, in centimeters, you should mention, you know, the GOJ is at, uh, you know, this 38 centimeters and the hydrus hernia is about 3 centimeters. So, then... You can, in addition, make a small comment that it may be small, medium or large, depending on what you feed. So, but yeah. otherwise, you know, this small, meat, we might have to do this, repeat the endoscopy. If mm. we, if we are to proceed for um, fund application, if these doc necessary findings are not properly documented. Yeah, 100% agree. Yes. Right. So, I will move on to the video and I will talk while I'm um, uh, sort of while the video is playing. Um, this is an interesting patient. Uh, can you see the can you see the video? Can you can, can yes. you can you right I'll try and enlarge this right okay so this is an interesting patient she is for she's a vet surgeon who was 44 years of age, having um, intractable reflux for about two years. And um, she's also the vet surgeon who treats uh, Mr. Janaka de Silva's Labrador. So he had been treating uh, this patient with PPIs and then when it was not responding, then he had got the esophageal pH manometry, everything done. And he uh, had um, anti-reflux uh, surgery about a year ago. So uh, the get the liver uh, the liver 
factored. Just to do, uh, by the way, I haven't given you the the fourth positions because you know this was not recorded for a for a for a talk. Uh, normally, what we do is I use one ten mm port for the camera and um, uh, four other five millimeter ports. So I don't put any other ten mm ports because and I uh, insert the needle through the camera port and um, take the needle out also through the camera port by reversing right so i don't i use only uh, i use only um, uh, uh, four, uh, only uh, uh, five ports uh, of which only the camera port is a 10 mm uh, one has to assess the distance from um, from the from where the geo we generally put the uh, the the 10 uh, the camera port to, um, to the right of the midline, about uh, three to four centimeters above the umbilicus. Then we have a port in the right hypochondrium, a port in the left hypochondrium. So those are the two working ports. Then we have a port in the sternum, uh, close to the sternum for retraction of the liver. And then also another port uh, in the um, at the level of the umbilicus, uh, 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 which is about uh, uh, six or seven centimeters lateral to the umbilicus, so that is uh, that is the placement of ports. If it is unclear, I will explain uh, later. If it's unclear to anybody, right? So the first step is actually to get this liver retracted. There are many ways of doing it. Uh, some people would use an Athenson's type of retract. They are, you get a very good uh, elevation of the, of the liver. Uh, but it is often not necessary when you're doing a fundoplication. But if you're doing something like a GOJ tumor, in those situations, the Nathanson retract becomes very useful. An alternative is the fan-shaped retract, which is available in most theaters. The only thing about the, uh, the fan shape retractor is that somebody has to be holding it all the time. One assistant has to be holding it all the time. And also one little trick is if you are using it, don't um, press it towards the liver and open it. Don't press it onto the liver. In this, don't open it in this position that you're seeing on the screen because you can get damage the Occasion, I had a little bleeding. Of course, it's settled, right? In fact, uh, you know, it's a little uh, bit of a nuisance, you know, when that happens. Because this is an operation you try to do without any bleeding. Right. Now, uh, so what we are trying to do here is, is this video is uh, not really edited, right? It's hardly edited. Uh, what we are trying to do here is to get the is to get the get the liver retracted, right? And uh, the cameraman is sort of moving around a bit. Yeah, sometimes it's a bit difficult to in, uh, introduce that left hand port, right? Because your uh, introduce because your it the port, port is on the other side of the falciform, right? So your instrument comes from the other side of the falciform, but uh, generally you can get it adjusted. Now this pull that we are now trying to do, right? And this is the port I said, which is at the level of the umbilicus, right? Come up in that direction. That tends to uh, stretch the pars flexida, right? That tends to stretch the pars flexida, which is here, right? And uh, can you see my arrow? You can see the arrow, right? Okay. So uh, this is the pars flexida, and you find that even in obese people, right? Even in obese people, this area is thin. It's a bit like that uh, the place from where you enter the lesser sac on the greater curve of the stomach, right? Uh, something like that, right? So this area is uh, is quite thin. And it is actually the chordate low. So the dissection starts here, and uh, you can actually use the fast mode of the of the harmonic, right? You can use the ha harmonic or whatever 
energy source that you're using, right? You can use the, the, the fast mode uh, and uh, start the dissection. Now, our aim here is to expose the right crust, right? What we are trying to do is to expose the right crust. We are not still seeing it, right? But we have to open this. Uh, this, by the way, this transparent area that you see from where we start is also called the Kutzner's window by, uh, by some authors, right? So, and a little bit of blunt dissection always at this stage helps a bit. And uh, here we're going to open this uh, window a little bit wider. And there you're starting to see the right crust now. Right? You're starting to see, you're seeing the right crust. In fact, not starting to see, you're seeing the right crust right now. And uh, what we want to do is to expose it further by, uh, by dissection. There is also a thing called the left crust technique, right? There are some surgeons who start on the left side. Uh, their argument is that the left crust forms the esophagus in the majority. Right? So now here we are now moving on to dissecting uh, the, the right crust. Right? And uh, we try our best to keep the peritoneum on the crust intact. Um, because uh, then it becomes, uh, it's better when you are doing a crural repair. Right? But sometimes it gets denuded. Right? Actually, in this case, I think it got denuded, but we managed to sort it out. And I will show you how that was done. So uh, here now we are exposing the, I'm exposing the, the, the right crust. So this is called actually hiatal surgery because what you do is you um, you display the crura clearly and uh, when you display the crura clearly then you find that then the esophagus is not a problem right identifying the esophagus is not a problem so there you see uh, further further area Yeah, there's the crust again. And we always incise the peritoneum at that margin of the crust, right? at the margin of the crust, getting gradually upwards and always a little front push. Uh, with the with the harmonic actually helps. Right. Now what we are trying to do is to uh, uh, now we sort of moved on to the other side. Sorry, sorry. Um, that's the that's the liver retractor. Now, at this, in this area, when you're dissecting, you may encounter uh, the hepatic branch of the left gastric artery. This patient doesn't have it, right? But some patients, you may get the hepatic branch of the, uh, 
of the uh, uh, let's can right so now we are sort of moving on to the other side right in these operations it's always better to move things around right and see what is easy and do what is easier right now this is the uh yes yes sorry switch off but all ah, right okay just just a second i will try to do that right i'll try to i'll try to do that right okay okay uh dr bhavant uh, is telling professor bhavant is telling me to switch off my uh, uh, my um, video uh, for uh, for uh, to switch off my video because uh, affecting the running of the video so let me just try to do that uh, ishan it's a, it's your picture i mean yeah uh, yeah i know yeah, i know the, i'll the, try and yeah i'll try and uh, just yeah. a minute i yeah. will try and i'll stop this for a moment and uh, right i've stopped it okay that's great yeah thanks and uh, let me now uh, enlarge this yeah okay so this is a dissection of the 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 peritoneum right in front of the um, in front of the esophagus right and now you can see that the esophagus right is uh, is coming into view right the esophagus is coming into view and that's the area of the goj and uh, again uh, one has to be a little careful uh, dissecting here because you don't want to damage the the vagus sometimes these vagus nerves are very thin the posterior vagus usually is not so problem because if you stay on the esophagus generally is not too much of a uh you have to reposition it uh, uh you have to sometimes reposition this uh, retractor now you see on that occasion as a result of trying to reposition the retractor right there was a little denuding of the the of the peritoneum but uh, we sorted out that out at the end right right now the dissection is proceeding upwards towards the chest right and you can see uh, this is the patient's right right on the right side of the esophagus uh, blunt dissection you can get a little bleeding here but it's usually not a problem if you consider that during transcytal esophagectomy all this was done um, done with the with the finger right without any view at all right so uh, so uh, now uh, but having said that right in laparoscopy even a little bit of blood is a nuisance it absorbs the light and it obscures your view right so therefore we try our best to uh, to dissect without uh, without causing any injury to the blood vessels um another um, thing about the 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 uh, 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 this is that you need to get a adequate length right you need to get a adequate length of the of the esophagus you need to get a adequate length of the esophagus 
down into the stomach to uh, to uh, do the wrap. Now there you can see there's a little bit of bleeding, but this sort of bleeding we know, right? We get this thing even when you get uh, even when you're doing uh, fundos and so on, uh, ecclesias and so on, and generally, right? This sort of little bit of oozing, right? Usually tends to stop. But if you have any concern, one thing you can do, or if you have any difficulty, one thing you can do is to take um, is to take the um, uh, is to have a swab inside, right? A lot of people um, uh, swab as a sling, right? I tend to use the swab as a sling. So there you can see the 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 the. Now we are basically dividing the gastro. Um, Prinic ligament, right? The gastrosprinic uh, ligament. That is that little bit of. Uh, uh, this really all these ligaments are basically condensations of tissue, right? So, uh, this dividing the gastrosprinic ligament, ligament. You can see the esophageal hiatus, right? Which has been uh, which has been dissected, and uh, the esophagus uh, coming through that. Now. Basically, we are um, dissecting on the left side, right, on the on the left crust, uh, to keep the um, to uh, so that we can ultimately uh, go around the go around the esophagus, right. So this is a bit of uh, peritoneum being dissected there. And now further dissection of the esophagus towards the goje. The cameraman um, is um, also very important, right? You see, um, I mean, they're doing a reasonable good job, but uh, now you see up just right, my left hand grasper, and then sweeping downwards to create that plane behind the esophagus. So actually, in um, in laparoscopic surgery, this in open surgery you normally hold some right with the forceps and then you um, use the, that is with the left hand right and then with the right hand you cut or whatever it is right or you open the plane now here you basically need to use the open blades of the uh, of your left hand instrument to lift up and uh, then you work with the right hand instrument and we do a lot of this in uh, the colorectal surgery right Right, so you can see a fair length of the esophagus, right, has now been dissected, and we are able to pass a grasp from the right side to the left. Now, that now a grasp and not a Maryland, because normally the Maryland is an instrument with which we you know we create pains and so on, but uh, apparently. Um, there have been instances, uh, at least I've been told this by Indian surgeons, that there have been instances where people have tried to create the plane esophagus, uh, the mainland, and they have perforated the posterior wall of the esophagus. And the perforation on the posterior wall can sometimes even go undetected. Right? 
Now the next thing is to get a sling around the esophagus. Now you can use a nylon tape for this, right? That's perfectly fine. I use a swab, a half swab, because then if there is a little bit of blood there, right? Here, of course, this is you know bloodless, but if a little bit of blood, uh, and there could always be a little bit of blood, the blood gets absorbed, right, onto the with this, and uh, it doesn't cause a problem, right? But you can. You're, it's quite fine, right? To use a use a nylon tape. I'm sure some of you um, may be using uh, may be using a nylon tape. Right. So there goes the grasp under the esophagus, and here we catch it, right? And uh, you know, pulling this through also causes a little bit of dissection, right? Posteriorly, um, this. Using the grasp, this using the swab for this, I actually learned from uh, Dr. Palani Velu. Um, I don't know whether he still does it, does it this way. It was a long time ago. And he, of course, used to tie this, right? But I found it's really not necessary to tie. Now you see there is a little bit phrenic ligament, right? Little bit that has to be uh, divided there to make the esophagus more free. The only bit of uh, self-criticism here is that, uh, as you can see, the peritoneum has got denuded, right, on the surface of the of the left crust here. But uh, it didn't become a problem when um, when we uh, do, did the crural repair, because sometimes what can happen is that you know the stitch can cut through, right, when there is no peritoneum. Some people uh, use pledges for these uh, for these sutures. But you can solve the problem by taking the bite a little bit, uh, a little bit further away, which I will show you in the end. Right, sir. So. As I said, you know, this was not recorded for teaching purposes. I actually fished it out from the library. It took me some time also to get it organized. Uh, if we were doing it for, you know, a demonstration, then uh, we would have uh, done it better because, uh, you know, because uh, then you would, you know, stop and show certain things, right? So we swing the esophagus round in all directions just to make sure right, that it has been adequately dissected. And now the next thing would be basically to go for the for the for the short gastrics. Now about regard short gastrics, right? There have been controversies, in fact, in the annals of the Royal College of Surgeons. There was once a discussion to divide or not to divide. And there, were, there was one surgeon writing in favor of division and another person writing uh, against division. Uh, what we have found is that you can get a better rap generally when you divide. Uh, 
uh, the when you're dividing these, you have to be a little bit away from the stomach, not too far away, but a little bit away uh, because unlike in a sleeve gastrectomy, you know, uh, uh, going to remove this, right? Um, it's not, not going to be removed here, right? During the, in this operation, so therefore one has to be careful and uh, to retract. The, the tissues in the in the opposite direction right, to put the uh, to put this um, uh, the the short gastrics under stretch. Generally, about two or three short gastrics get divided uh, during this procedure. So the dissection is uh, proceeding upwards, right, towards the hiatus, um, taking down uh, the short gastrics to make the fundus a little more mobile. There you see the spleen, and uh, it's very important not to injure the splenic capsule, right? Not to injure the splenic capsule. Some of these short gastrics are true to their name, very very short, right? So one has to be quite careful uh, not to uh, not to uh, injure the injure the spleen. Bit of a tight rope sometimes because you can't, you know go too close to the stomach and burn the stomach at the same time you can't uh, damage the spleen also but usually it is not a problem so those are the now coming towards the last of the short gastrics right you can see how Carefully, right? I am um, dividing because so this is also uh, critical steps where you know one has to be quite careful.
I mean, for the trainees, what you care to say is that in, in laparoscopy, there is, you know, it's very fine movements, right? As you can see, you can't do it shut part, right? Particularly, you know, procedures like this. Or rather steps like this, right? Where, you know, it's very, very close to the, very close to the spleen there at that point because half a centimeter, right, towards the spleen, right, could ruin your operation completely. This dissection, of course, is similarly done for uh, sleeve gastrectomies and so on. But there, of course, you're not very bothered even if you know that part of the stomach you know gets a little burnt because if we are going to remove it when there used to be a question that, you know, we used to be asked those days, how many short gastrics are there? And the expected answer was one more than you think. So uh, here, of course, you're not going to remove, re divide all the short gastrics, right? It's only the, the lower, um, uh, sorry, the upper uh, three, two or three short gastrics that we divide. There is another uh, little attachment there, right? Which is being, uh, which is being divided. The short gastric part seems to be largely free now. few more attachments to the spleen. This is all part of the gastrosplenic ligament. And you can see now the fundus is quite, quite free. Sometimes you can pull the fundus up, when I say directly up to the anterior abdominal wall to get an idea as to how, how free it is, right? So you can see the hiatus, um, the left crust there. One advantage of having this as a swab be suppose some, you know, you get a little bleeding, you can use the same swab to gently mop that area or even to apply a little pressure till the bleeding stops. Here, of course, there's no bleeding. Right, so there you can see the esophagus, right? Quite We see some strands, those are actually the the posterior vagus, right, the barges. And uh, now we are sort of enlarging, right, that uh, the, the window behind the esophagus so that we can do an effective wrap. Right, so now we're trying to get the wrap around. Usually use a bubble grasper for this. Hold it from the appropriate side and then try and pull it, right? And now you can see it is coming 
and this is what is called the shoe shine maneuver right um surgeons love to do this right um basically um, rubbing it around right giving it a giving it you know creating a little more space right because that itself does a bit of dissection just like what this swab did we now the other thing you can appreciate here is now even when you let go right the uh, the the fundus doesn't see because if it goes back if it recoils right uh, it's something like you know if you catheterize the bladder in a patient and when you let go the catheter if the catheter comes out right that means it's not in the bladder right so like here also right make sure that exactly Uh, that you know we have uh, adequately mobilized the fundus it shouldn't go back right um, now if i sort of a little earlier in the operation or without dividing the short gastrics if i had uh, done the same thing right chances i could have gone the other thing is to check right whether we can do a adequate i mean a 2 to 3 cm rep is more than enough right but you have to make sure that you do a that we can do a adequate rep uh, the other thing is that um, that um, uh yes uh the rap yes the rap should be around the esophagus right because if you dissect down below right uh you might find that you know your rap may be coming actually serve in purpose right because we want to do a we want to do the rap around the esophagus right so now you can see there is a adequate um, adequate wrap right there is an adequate um, adequate wrap but uh, you know as surgeons you know we are never happy right we want to do a little bit more always right you can see those uh, nerve fibers there right this the those are the that one right those are the posterior vagus Yes, right. Actually, in this paper, anterior vagus was not very uh, clearly demonstrated. Right? We looked very uh, looked carefully for it. Right? Um, it was. It's probably still there. Right? Among those, um, among the uh, the strands there. yeah now you can see once we let now that mobilization here right because when i when i let go right it didn't uh, really come back trying to make it a little better but i think that's actually quite adequate right and uh, sometimes when you want to dissect more you have to put the fundus back into its original
also please remember that now in some hospitals right these things are recorded right so not this but now say for example if somebody does a laparoscopic cholecystectomy right and then you know divides a common bile duct or something like that, evidence is there right okay anyway now uh, so uh, now we have got the needle in right we got the got the needle in and uh, now again with regard to the suture material i used to use proline right because you have to use a non absorbable suture material the best would probably be something like ethibond you can see it very well and it not securely right so when i was doing this my uh, our senior registrar he said so why don't you use uh, silk it's much black silk right it is much easier to uh, to you know uh, tie the sutures and so on so on this occasion we used black silk and uh, i must say it was good but the rule is it should be a, you can't you shouldn't use uh, this uh, polygalactin you should use a, a, a non absorbable suture so this we are i think getting yeah doing the crural repairs so that's the way you hold the needle we straighten it a little bit right at the time we put it in and now i am going to repair the 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 cross with uh, just one stitch right so that is the bite on the left cross now i told you this bit about the uh, uh the peritoneum being uh, denuded sometimes in spite of all the care right you get there is a little bit of uh, peritoneum being denuded there but it's not 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 a problem right i'll show you it's nice if you can have the peritoneum on the on the cross right but when we take the next bite we correct it right so instead of taking the bite right from where you see right we put the needle in there and if you note i just move this this way right and then take the bite from a area which is peritonized right take the bite out to suture out from an area which is uh, which is uh, which is peritonized um it's very important not to narrow the hiatus too much right uh crural repairs are also to an extent controversial there are some who believe that there is no uh, added benefit in repairing the crura but uh, one problem is that if you don't there is this possibility of a um, rap migration the rap migrating upwards sometimes i um, put a stitch right after doing the fundoplication i put a stitch from the fundus to the cross Uh, to prevent the the rap from migrating, if I have any doubt about uh, the size of the uh, the size of the defect, size of the hiatal opening, right? Since you are suturing in a small place, right? It is uh, good to keep that short end around one o'clock, right? So that you can uh, you can tighten. Uh, Uh, sorry you can um, so that you can uh, catch it easily uh, when you want to tie uh, the cameraman becomes very important right in in suturing uh, because uh, you know what he shows you um, matters right uh, with this suture material the not sec and you can see they i open out the instrument when you pause right to uh, a little um, you uh, uh, it prevents the suture from slipping right now you know pull in the correct direction because this maryland which i am using on the left hand has a little bit of a groove right and the suture tends to get stuck in that groove if that happens you just give it a little knock right and uh, it just uh, in then it uh, that is what i am doing there right you just give it you just push it like that right and then you catch the thing the camera work is not particularly brilliant at this point uh, i have to say uh, 
when Chaturanga was around, he did it better. Okay. Right. Okay. So there you can see the peritoneum coming around and this, uh, this uh, suja held nicely, right? This, uh, uh, this, this particular suja, even though you know, the whole thing was not covered with, uh, with peritoneum. And uh, it's actually useful to put two throws, right? On the first uh, knot, like I did, right? And then after that, of course, a single throw would be, uh, would be sufficient, right? So you may first knot the surgeon's knot, right? After that, you can put uh, the reef knot. Now, there are some uh, actually good surgeons who actually do this knotting outside. Uh, I've seen this Mr. Rao in uh, Singapore and all. They actually do bring the sutures out and do extra corporeal knot and slide it in, right? It's of course very fast, but um, we generally tie, uh, try intra, uh, try, tie intracorporeally, right? So you can see it's uh, coming together there, right? Tightening with the second knot. Swap is probably a little bit in the way, right? So at this stage, probably something like a nylon tape probably would have been better. That's the final, not the third one. Again, when you pull in the correct direction, it comes, right? Doesn't get stuck on the, uh, in the Maryland. Right. Right, okay. The other thing about uh, laparoscopic suturing is that once you get the needle through, right, you need to drop the needle and hold with the suture, right? Because if you are holding the needle right, and moving it around, you can injure various uh, places, right? So now, Sometimes you get like, you know, both strands getting seen, but when you pull it, right, it, it comes out, right?
right. Okay. Waiting, waiting for the C, sir. There it comes. And the suja is cut. Now the next thing is to take this, uh, our sling, that is the swab out. Yeah. Yeah, so now we're taking that uh, the swab out, right? And now getting ready to do the wrap. A little adjustment of the uh, this uh, the livery tractor, right, is sometimes needed. And now we have the grasp uh, posterior to the esophagus. Now. In Um, again, important not to really pull hard, right, but to tease it right around, um, which is what you're doing right now. The other thing about uh, stomach or is of or whatever you're holding is don't pinch it, take a good bite, right? Because uh, if you pinch it, right, there's a chance that you might tear it, right? So there you are, we are uh, getting the uh, getting the fundus around. The anterior vagus would be here, right inside this uh, fascial envelope, because we have not reached that. Yeah, again, a little bit of shoe shining. Now you can, it's a very floppy uh, 
is going to be a very floppy wrap, right? Because it's coming right through and uh, it'll be a very floppy uh, kind of uh, design. Short and floppy, right? Right, so taking the bite from the fundus on the uh, left side of the esophagus and now from the appropriate place, right, on the, on the other side, you have to be a bit of a tailor to figure out from where you're going to take these, uh, take these bites, right. And also make sure that the wrap is around the esophagus. Now, uh, sometimes what we do is actually we take a bite from the esophageal muscle also, right? The only thing is that, you know, esophageal muscle is not a very strong layer and whether that actually uh, helps, right, is, uh, is debatable. Right. First. using a short suture material using the same one that I used earlier. Um, if you're using a short suture material, then of course you have to hold with the needle. Otherwise you can't, um, you can't get the uh, knot. Sometimes it's better to throw this away and get another one. Okay. So that side, the suture slides out nicely, right? Because the needle holder doesn't have that groove. Uh, you can um, definitely use a, uh, you can use two, uh, uh, needle holders, right, for the purpose of time, right? You can use two needle holders. There are some people who actually, uh, uh, some people who actually uh, use the gynecologist, they have a thing called a needle holder and a supporter. The supporter is also something like a needle holder and uh, they use that for the, for the purpose of, uh, for the purpose of suturing. Probably not the cleverest thing to do here. I think it would have been better to get another suture. Yeah.
Ya. Other thing is that sometimes when you uh, pull the stitch, you must try to keep the short end short. Uh, here. If the short end was a little shorter, uh, the suturing, the putting the subsequent knots would have been easier. can see there's a little bit of a gap there right but i will correct that right with the next uh, with the next stitch so we take the needle out by uh, by reversing right uh, through the same uh, camera port, the same port through which we uh, uh, put the needle in, right? Okay. So this way you can do it with one 10 mm cam, one 10 mm port and uh, four five mm ports. Because in this operation, we are not going to use a clip applicator or anything like that. That will show you that, that gives you a sort of a glimpse of the ports, right? Because I couldn't uh, show it earlier, right? So uh, I can see the port positions that I uh, mentioned, right? Okay, so you take the needle out and then you're back in. You can see that the wrap is staying, right? It's not under any tension or anything, right? You can see the heart uh, pulsating, right? That is the central tendon of the diaphragm. waiting for the next needle, the next suture material to come in.
Yeah, so that's how we get done easily, right? We don't put it, uh, we don't need another 10 mm port. Um, actually, you can use a 5 mm camera for this. The only problem with 5 mm cameras is that they often get fogged, right? Quite, uh, quite, uh, quite easily. That's the only problem with, uh, with, uh, with, with the 5 mm, uh, 5 mm cameras. So if you notice, we straighten the needle a bit before we put it in. Uh, that helps us to take it out, right? Especially because we are doing a, a reversing. Yeah, so you got to keep it and see, right? Which place it would, you know, come best. Uh, the other thing is you have to be a little careful here. You can puncture the liver, right? Because one of my SR some time ago, uh, he was putting this, it went right through the liver, but uh, nothing happened. Uh, at least there was no bleeding, right? You know that uh, you don't always get uh, bleeding with, uh, with a liver injury. Yeah, so when that happens, what you do is you turn the 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 needle and the other way, right? That's why these are all rotatable uh, instruments, right? And then you can get it. So always good to have two throws on the on the first uh, first knot. Give it a little push if it's getting into the groove. So I'm It's difficult to pull in the in the correct directions. And then what you do is you just push it like that, then catch it, and then pull the suja through. Right. right. Yeah, you see that is wrapping right around the GOJ, right? You can see the GOJ there and uh, and you can see that's sitting nicely. Now comes the next stitch, the next knot, sorry. 
You can see it's, it's tightening well. Uh, right now, some people use a bougie, right? To make sure that it doesn't, uh, that you're not doing it too tight, right? But uh, I, of course, don't um, don't use a, a bougie uh, routinely. Right? We use, I mean, for sleep gastrectomies and so on. But for this, we don't um, routinely use a, use a bougie, right? But... Uh, People who use it say that you know it's it's beneficial because you uh, prevent uh, yourself from tightening too much. But as you can see, I mean this is quite a floppy wrap, right? And uh, this patient actually did very well after surgery. Now she is about one year post surgical and uh, absolutely fine. She had a lot of symptoms before, and uh, it's all got relieved. So ultimately, the proof of put the pudding is in the eating. Also, you can see that in this operation, apart from doing the fundoplication, right now there's a fair amount of esophagus inside the stomach. It's above the wrap, right? Um, it's above the wrap. There you can see it, right? There you can see, right? There is a fair amount of uh, esophagus, right? And uh, in all these patients, right, who have a hiatus hernia, you know that uh, the GOJ is pulled up into the into the chest sometimes uh, people pass an instrument uh, just under this right they pass an instrument just under the wrap to see whether it's uh, whether it's loose or tight right i've seen people doing that Again, we take the needle out by, by reversing, right? Talking about reversing, once a patient came to a surgeon and said, Mata, me reverse karanna bear. So the surgeon thought he was having cervical spondylosis, but actually he was having phimosis. Always important to have a final look right at everything and uh, also to make sure there is no bleeding, make sure you've taken out the swabs and everything, right? Or nylon tapes or whatever that you put in, right? These are things that will otherwise take you to hulched off, okay? Yeah, there you can see, right? That area, everything is fine, there's no bleeding, right? The wrap is. Uh, sitting there and there is about about maybe about two centimeters right of uh, esophagus inside the the, the abdominal cavity right? so this occasion i didn't fix the wrap but in some situations we take a bite from the fundus from the wrapped fundus to the uh, to the diaphragm right we have a doubt That is the swab, right? Was a little bit useful. That little bit of blood would have, uh, would have soaked it. Okay, so that is all.
any questions, anything that you would like to ask? We still have about four minutes more. Uh, Prof. Ishan, uh, Prof. Bhavanta had to leave a little early because he had a personal commitment. So therefore, he wanted me to, um, you know, do the final proceedings. So yeah. uh, if I ask a small question, like uh, for the rap, uh, after doing the rap, do you uh, suture the rap into the... Yeah, in uh, fact, that's, was, yeah, that's what I was telling right now. Sometimes, yeah. right, if I have a doubt, if I feel that the rap will sort of go, uh, will go my, will migrate, mm -hmm. uh, especially in mm -hmm. patients who have a short esophagus, uh, in those patients, I tend to do a stitch from the, you, you, you yourself might have seen me doing that, you know? Uh, yes, yes, put, yes. Yeah, exactly. So I do put a stitch from the rap to, uh, from the rap to the, to the, to the right cross. So that's not difficult at all. That's not a difficult stage. But uh, on this occasion, I was quite satisfied that the rep was, you know, sitting uh, sitting nicely, and uh, it's not going to, uh, you know, it's not uh, now. Uh, you know that when you uh, do say you do say intra corporeal uh, inguinal hernia step, right? Uh, when you uh, put the new do the pneumoperitoneum you find that the hernia sometimes reduces right so that is so therefore just because you know you take the pneumoperitoneum away it's not going to push the you know that's not going to push the the wrap uh, into the into the chest so i mean i in this instance i was happy so that's why i didn't uh, i didn't put, do that uh, stitch but sometimes yes if there's any doubt i always take a stitch uh, from the wrap to the to the uh, to the right truss uh, sir, when, when are you going to remove the NG? Uh, so, because you keep the NG inside, isn't it? Uh, so, uh, immediately yeah. or the day after? Yeah, generally, because it's because it's there, we'll remove it the next morning. We generally tend to, uh, tend to remove it the next morning. Because generally, in these patients, you don't have a problem of, um, of uh, high NG output. So, uh, so, what we do is we generally tend to, uh, tend to remove it in the morning. This was done in the... We want to remove, uh, remove uh, nasogastric tubes and so on. So we take it out in the morning. So if uh, trainees, uh, if they have any questions, you can send uh, via the chat box to uh, Prof. Ishan. So uh, uh, I think uh, you did an excellent presentation uh, and excellent talk uh, as usual. <laughs> Prof. Ishan always. Very good in explaining things uh, for the trainees. I think it's uh, he, he did it in a very elaborative way. So uh, even even sir, uh, what we do is in the in in the UK, what I have the centre I work, they give a sloppy diet for two weeks yeah. after the yeah. after the uh, fund application. As you mentioned, some people practice uh, liquids for two weeks and then the little bit of a blenderized diet for another uh, another couple of weeks and gradually uh, build up the uh, nutrition so yes. uh, it varies from personal i think it's something personal isn't it so yeah I, I i totally agree because i mean the the first few patients we did right would have probably had a burian you know in a week's time you know they, because we didn't test them anything i mean we just started the orals and then uh, you know told them you know they can have a normal diet and send them off but uh, it is later that uh, at least from these you know as you say place where you work and these high volume centers they tell us that it's a bit better to go slow on the diet. In the uh, bariatric surgeries, of course, the reason is a little different. When you do a sleep, you, the patient has to get used to that smaller stomach, isn't it? So that there's a different uh, reason for that. But uh, many units practice the same for uh, those patients as well as for these patients. Thank you, sir. Uh, so uh, I don't know whether there are any questions in the chat box. I can't uh, see just a minute. Uh, uh, Lakmal, yeah. if you can see any questions, you can ask from Prof. Ishan. So, uh, um, he's the co-host. Co I haven't got the... I haven't got the... Uh, I can't enlarge this. Lakmal, is there any questions uh, asked from Prof.? Uh, Uh, no, sir. Nothing in the chat box. Ah, okay, okay. Thank, Thank you. you. Okay, right. Sir, I think in... 10 o'clock and everybody must be sleepy. 
<laughs> uh, sir, uh, we actually, on behalf of uh, Slam Arts, uh, so we will be doing uh, a workshop. We, we just want to make an announcement, 23rd of November. So it will be done in uh, Chandi and uh, Sri Lanka Minimal Access uh, Society, uh, Digital Surgeon Society. So we'll be doing this workshop. And it will be live transmission to, uh, and we'll be send the links to you. And uh, there's a uh, present audience as well in the uh, KSM auditorium in Kandy. And surgery will be on the theater that will be transmitted. So we'll be doing a laparoscopic mesen fund application. And uh, 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 laparoscopic uh, splenectomy. In addition, we'll be discussing a few important topics in surgery, laparoscopic surgery. You know, we have a very good faculty. Yeah, so you all all the trainees uh, we invite on behalf of Slamas, we'll be inviting you to join on that day. So it's a live workshop, and uh, so uh, so you can come in the presence also because we can accommodate you in our KSM auditorium in according to health guidelines. So uh, and uh, Prof. Bhavanta wants me to thank uh, uh, Prof. Ishanti Saisa for spending a lot of time on this you know, this uh, fund application um, lecture plus the uh, this video. So which guided, I think, most of our trainees to understand, you know, how, how the decisions are made. And he made it in very clear, repetitive way. And also the video showed uh, the tricks and tricks of the trade. So, uh, and I hope you have learned a good uh, uh, lesson from that. And you, I hope you will join on 23rd of uh, workshop for the College of Surgeons uh, collaborative workshop with Slam Arts. So, and thank you for joining. Thank you, Prof. Ishan, and on behalf of uh, Slam Arts. So, and Prof. Bhavanta, I want to thank you. Yeah. Yeah, okay. Thank you, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Chaturanga. Thank you. Thank you very much.